I'm excited to talk to you today um, in the context of all this amazing work you've been doing on the metabolic sublime. Um, and if I could have the screen sharing enabled, I'll show some slides to go along with this. But basically, I'm going to talk about the, the period that's been called the mid-transition. Um, are, you able, are you able to share a screen? Shall we? No, I'm not actually. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. We are working on it. Yeah. You should be able to do it now. Wonderful, thank you. Here you go. So thinking about the mid-transition, I'll get to that um, in a few minutes, but I wanted to start out with this idea of geoengineering. I'm not gonna talk about geoengineering in detail, um, but the point I want to make about it is that when people have been thinking about a planetary scale intervention to cool the climate, this is kind of the extreme form, solar geoengineering, for example, by increasing the amount of clouds and how reflective they are, or putting reflective particles into the atmosphere to reflect a small fraction of incoming sunlight and thereby cool the planet. Um, in some ways, we already have some uh, inadvertent um, effects from the pollution that's already in the troposphere. Intentional solar geoengineering would involve putting particles into the stratosphere where they're high up so they would stay for a longer period of time, one to two years before falling to earth, circulating around the whole globe. And so this would require a small fleet of aircraft flying constantly and indefinitely unless both <laughs> emissions reductions and carbon removal takes place. So pretty extreme intervention. Um, and scientists have studied a little bit about the ecosystem implications, the implications on food production, on the ocean. I mean, there's a lot going on, obviously a very complex system, but this is what people think of sometimes if they think of planetary scale interventions with climate change. And what I wanna to say today is let's set that aside. It kind of sets up a false dichotomy, I think, between planetary scale interventions that are very high tech with the unitary decision maker versus the energy transition, which is imagined to be often small scale, renewable and so on. Um, and so, the main frame for climate policy with the energy transition, obviously right now is net zero. We've seen all these net zero pledges um, coming up, which essentially means balancing some amount of positive emissions with some amount of negative emissions. And so you can see from this figure, this is a stylized look at what um, keeping temperatures below two degrees Celsius would look like you know that for 1.5 degrees, there would be an even more ambitious um, action with net zero uh, CO2 emissions around mid-century, a net zero greenhouse gas emissions a bit later. Um, but this implies a very rapid fall of emissions. It applies the construction of a pretty large negative emissions infrastructure to remove the carbon so we can get to that point of balance. Um, and it also highlights how a lot of the emissions that we're contending with aren't just CO2, but other greenhouse gas emissions from land use change, for example, or from agriculture. And so what I'd say about this scenario is that this actually also is a planetary intervention or implies one, um, that the energy transition, the land use transition, which often, um, we overlook and often I overlook, but I want to, to put it in here. And also this big carbon removal effort. These are also planetary in scale. They're different because they don't appear to require this one decision maker who's doing the design or the planning. But actually I think that it's helpful to look at them um, through a planetary lens as well. 
And right now, the main way we think about climate action, at least in the policy space, is to break it down into sectors. So this is understandable because it's such a complex problem that we need to break it down into smaller pieces to even think about it. So, for example, the International Energy Agency would make kind of a net zero map like this that shows some things we have to do with electricity, with industry, with transport, with buildings, and a lot of different milestones that, you know, we could put together into a picture of what needs to happen. Um, Spain's long-term strategy, you know, about 50 plus countries have submitted these long-term strategies under the Paris Agreement to the UNFCCC, um, which kind of say what they're going to do or what they could do. Um, a lot of them are just projecting out to 2050 to reach these net zero goals. And you can see again, um, kind of the sectoral framework with agriculture, buildings, industry, electricity, transport, and so on, some of the milestones. And you can also see an effort, I think, to start to put people into this framework. This is from the same report, also trying to highlight some of the activities. And you can see that, uh, you know, there's a consumer, there's digital transformation, there's kind of these activities that the authors of this policy document realize are important, but it's hard to place it into this sectoral decarbonization framework. So it just kind of hangs out, you know, in the background somehow. Um, and having worked in policy, I, I empathize with this, but I think that with all the creative work in design and storytelling and narrative and the arts, we have an opportunity to help the people who write these kind of reports out a bit more <laughs> with how to think about this. Um, but I wanted to talk a minute about what makes this energy transition planetary rather than kind of these de decentralized country by country or city by city things. Some of these are things you've already talked about in this program um, and basically land materials, international trade and the, the need for really a global discussion about phase out that isn't yet happening in the way we need it to. And for context, you know, about 80% or more of energy is still fossil fuels. We've been adding a lot of um, wind and solar to the mix, but it's still kind of at the very top, right? The, the basis of our society is still oil, coal, and gas. So this is really a planetary scale transformation that needs to happen, at part because of the land demands, um, and I'm sorry to show you a figure from the US, but it's the report I know the best. And we don't have yet this kind of spatially explicit mapping um, for all the countries yet, but for a very extreme renewable scenario that's 1.5 degrees compatible, you would need to devote really a lot of land to wind um, and solar, both onshore and offshore wind. Um, and there's a lot of challenges that come with that land access, with making it equitable. Um, and I don't say that to say that we won't do it. I hope we will. But just to acknowledge the scale um, that's implied. Same thing with minerals. The International Energy Agency has a report on the minerals needed for the energy transition. Um, pretty big scale up, both for um, electricity networks, for electric vehicles, um, in some instances for, for hydrogen, you know, lithium, but other um, minerals like cobalt, nickel, rare earths, even copper, there's a lot that will be required. And so there's, it's planetary because these flows are traded, they have implications. There's a lot of really critical justice questions that I know you've discussed about, you know, for example, lithium mining in the global south, other sorts of mining. We can also think about the potential for the electricity um, system to be global as well. And also hydrogen, to what extent are we imagining this um, new net zero infrastructure that's replacing gas with hydrogen or using ammonia for transportation. Um, and so all of these, I think, part of the metabolism that the researchers and thinkers here have been studying. Um, but I think another place where the planetary scale comes up is 
in the needs for fossil fuel phase out. So we know that right now countries and companies are still planning um, amounts of extraction that are really incompatible with these two degrees or 1.5 degrees pathways. Um, a huge gap, as you can read about in uh, the production gap report. And so one of the challenges is that um, we can think about phase out on a national level, and I hope we will continue to do that and, and debate about how we can. But there's a lot of countries um, that have state-owned uh, oil and gas companies or that are really reliant on this for their economies. So there's this geopolitical dimension to phase out where we could imagine phase out happening in smaller jurisdictions, but we need a planetary discussion about it. Um, so the challenges aren't just you know, things that can be dealt with by, by smaller jurisdictions alone. And then the land transition, I'll just briefly mention this as well. Um, right now about 70% of the land surface is used. You can look at that from the IPCC's report, special report on land, um, a lot for pasture, a lot for forestry. Um, and so how do we have this shift from using land for meat production generally um, and making sure these carbon sinks can grow, decreasing um, emissions from land use change. And so that's another part of it that, that's a planetary scale challenge. And then finally, carbon removal. Um, so there's a lot of different techniques for carbon removal, both uh, ecosystem-based, like forestation, um, enhancing soil carbon, but also more industrial techniques, such as enhanced rock weathering or capturing carbon directly from the atmosphere to inject underground for permanent geological storage in rock formations. Um, and so why, why is this even necessary? There's a, a few different rationales for it, but one thing I'll call attention to is just that a lot of the scenarios require some amount. So there's this new report out um, about the state of carbon dioxide removal that looks at the gap between what countries are talking about doing versus what's needed to meet these ambitious climate goals. Um, and it's really a gigaton scale. You can look at different scenarios, but even scenarios that are really focusing on demand reduction have um, you know, three to four plus billion tons of carbon removal that, that's required. And so this, this implies huge changes in both land use and infrastructure for carbon dioxide storage. And so I'd like to turn to this idea of the mid transition. I've talked a little bit about what these systems will need to look like in the middle and the end of the century. But this idea of the mid transition I think is useful. And I'm referring here to a paper by Emily Grubert and Sarah Hastings Smith, um, Simon, about uh, designing the mid transition. And they focused on the US, but you can apply this thinking really to, to any country because the basic idea of the mid transition is simply having this period in which there's two systems operating simultaneously energy supply is constrained because we need to have this goal of reducing emissions. Um, and we have both these fossil systems that are being phased out, these zero carbon systems, which are coming online, and they have 
structure and locking in some amount of continued carbon. So think, think for example, about all the pipelines that would need to be phased out. If you have an interim target, say at 2030 or 2050, that still allows you know, some amount of fossil fuels or that has substituted in hydrogen in some of these pipelines, um, you might risk getting stuck there if you don't have like a longer term picture. And right now with the net zero discourse, we don't really know if net zero is supposed to be a permanent state to maintain, or is it a temporary moment on the way to this longer term full phase out? It maintains this ambiguity. And that was necessary for political reasons, um, but it's dangerous in that we don't have a real plan for where we need to go. And, and like I suggested, I think this vision of where we need to go needs, needs more of a planetary consensus. We don't wanna get stuck in a world where one part of the world has fully decarbonized and another part has been a, unable to either because um, they just simply don't have the financial capacity in some countries because they haven't been well supported. Um, they haven't had you know, the adaptation finance or the help that they were promised delivered. That's a risk. Producer countries maybe also um, haven't had the incentives to phase out their production. So. I do think we need more of a, a global idea here. And I think one of the main challenges is that we have the sector-based model. So we can have some really interesting visions and excitements within um, carbon removal or within green buildings or within transportation. Um, and, and that's obviously one important step, but I think that maybe people are having trouble piecing these elements together into a vision that's really compelling enough for the large scale transformation that we need. And so there's this intuition that we need to, to center people and to center civil society, again, from Spain's um, long-term strategy, you know, the, they want to situate the citizen in, in the middle and there's all these different things that have to do with it. Um, but I don't think any country yet has really figured out how to do this well. And so there's um, an opportunity here for a lot of the fields that, that have been discussed today um, in terms of both improving this sectoral planning and supporting kind of the engineers and business people in each of these sectors that are thinking about uh, their decarbonization roadmaps to increase um, multi-stakeholder engagement, bring more people in. Um, I think that we can also tackle particular mid-transition problems. And, um, you know, there's, there's ways to connect better to quantitative modeling used in policy. There's also ways we can generate material that's not just about kind of flashy new things, but about phase out. So I think that for example, if we think about this problem of what do we do with the gas station, right? We don't want to just have really cool renderings of like the new concept of what a gas station could look like in the future as it becomes a charging station, maybe a community space in conjunction with EV charging. Um, that's one important point if we can like make that an attractive place that people want to spend time in and make them feel comfortable about EV adoption through seeing um, you know, different sorts of media about that space. That could also potentially alienate the gas station owner or worker that doesn't see themselves necessarily in there. So how do we think about generating stories and media that um, is not just about the flashy new things that we need, but also um, more inclusive when we're thinking about phasing out these, these older things. And also finally, how do we envision and tell stories that put these different sectoral pieces together um, and really enable participation? So I'll highlight one example that some colleagues at Third Way here in the US have worked on together with um, Gensler. They've been thinking about how do we help people picture what carbon management could look like. So they're trying to design these different landscapes that have some amount of carbon management infrastructure, but then also citing it while also thinking about these other things, the energy system more broadly, what's going on with land use, 
Um, so it's not just this one technology by itself, but embedding it in a system where people live, work, and play. And so, you know, this is one kind of initial attempt, but I think that there's so much the field could do. Um, and I look forward to maybe discussing this with you all for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly, for the lecture. That was amazing. Uh, I wonder if you have like a couple of minutes so we can we do like a very quick Q and A. Sure. Is good. I have a couple of questions myself, but I wonder if there is anyone in the public that may have any question. Alphonse, you have a mic. Thank you so much. Wait, is this working? This is working. Thank you so much, Holly, for the very lovely and informative and very, very dense presentation. I've learned a lot. I feel like I just attended three conferences at once. <laughs> um, my question actually also has to do with um, the development of this new mid-transition imaginary as rooted in the ideas of capital infrastructures, because I think that um, I'm particularly interested um, as to whether you have encountered any shifts in financing models of developing this particular infrastructure, knowing that, for example, financial institutions do maintain key holds and in, in terms of how infrastructure can be determined as well as the mapping of their distribution. So, you know, when you are, when we are thinking of the problem of transitioning, do you see simply a kind of transference of or the overlaying of the capital infrastructure from before, for example, the transmutation of petrol capital into then new energetic capital, or do you see, foresee a greater sense of displacement and replacement of newer industry that are contingent or reliant on different forms of financing? For example, larger community ownership or whatever that could exist. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, and also a, a difficult one. I think that there's a small amount of theorizing about different financing models, but I wouldn't have any um, successful examples to point to yet. I think that, I think that, I, and, and I'm sorry, I'm mostly familiar with the US context, but a lot of the people who are the most excited and vigorous about pushing forward the transition from an anti-capitalist perspective are also the most skeptical about sort of the large scale infrastructure projects. So there, there's sort of a, a gap there. I think that um, in the past few years, there's been kind of a revitalized conversation about public setter, sector models or community ownership and there's some language within the new um, legislation that coming out, for example, of the bipartisan infrastructure law, where um, people are interested in exploring what community ownership would look like for something like a carbon capture and storage facility, or you know, what's the role of um, public ownership in pipeline infrastructure for some of these new sorts of pipelines. But, um, there's definitely a lot to be done in this space in terms of articulating what that could look like and why it would be better, <laughs> which I think it would be. 